I'm very grateful to be here. And I have to say uh, up front that I, I do hope that in the future where we can uh, meet in person, uh, I'm very looking forward to having uh, the reason to come uh, to Budapest um, because it's one of my favorite culinary cities. But beside the point, um, I uh, am a researcher here at the University of Cambridge Faculty of Law. Um, but before I became a lawyer, I studied other things. Specifically, I studied uh, history and philosophy of science and religion, did both my undergrad and master's in those things. So when I came to study law, I approached it with a sort of broad perspective and what you might call an interest in big questions. So I, I'm going to do my best uh, over the time I have here to uh, throw a lot of big ideas at people to try and contextualize the ideological dimensions and some of the uh, presuppositions that underpin this thing called artificial intelligence and, and the debate. So uh, bear with me. I, I should say up front from my accent, uh, you could probably tell that I'm uh, not from uh, England, at least I'm from Canada. Uh, but that does beg the question as to why I'm here, um, which I should say, I am, of course, from 100% European ancestry. Um, my grandparents were among those who emigrated after the Second World War um, and were victims of uh, the Holocaust, of all things. But that's one reason I've always been very interested in law and power and how we justify order in society. So most recently, I put out a book with uh, Simon Deacon here at the Faculty of Law and Center for Business Research on the big picture question of, is law computable? What does it mean for the legal system in some sense, not just in small instances like automating uh, ombudsman refunds, what does it mean when we start talking about robot judges and all these other sort of bigger manifestations of using AI and computation more generally? Uh, so this is a book we put out with a lot of people who are very uh, much experts in the field of technology and law um, to pose these questions about uh, what happens if we try and compute this? Um, so uh, that's my plug-in. But for the purposes of our discussion, I want to talk about the use of artificial intelligence in legal decision making. Now, that's a broad word, so I'm going to use the term predictive law and automated uh, consequences, for lack of a better term. That is collapsing the time horizon between somebody committing an offense or doing something wrong under the law and imposing a penalty. So this is where things start getting very science fiction-y, um, but this seems to be what's implicated in at least the near horizon. Uh, people, there's lawyers in the room, no doubt. You'll probably have heard about a number of companies uh, building what we call legal tech. That is legal technology, which is just a shorthand for the use of uh, computation, machine learning sometimes. It's usually sold as AI, but rarely is AI properly uh, to help lawyers solve uh, lawyer problems, whether it's a uh, collaboration, document review, contract management, the sort of bureaucratic elements that go on in a uh, law office the world over, and indeed is the kind of work that junior lawyers uh, are often uh, those to do, because AI, in whatever form it is, is really good at doing at least the more elementary or procedural tasks that we give to sort of junior attorneys. These companies uh, do a lot of different work, but one of the things that really caught my attention is the phenomenon of using AI to create what is called predictive algorithms. That is a tool, a software application that in some sense can predict the outcome of court cases. And of course, this slide that you see is indicative of the kind of claims that are made. This is from a company called Law Geeks. Um, but as someone who has really studied uh, you know, these sort of truth claims that underpin not just religion and science and certainly uh, law, I, my ears perked up when I started seeing claims, claims, like, claims like this come out. Because it's really, it's really hard, hard to know how good you are at predicting the future. Um, there's a, that, that idea of uh, how you could quantify that by just being really good at judges' homework yesterday um, doesn't necessarily guarantee you at being good at it today. So. Despite these sort of conceptual uh, objections that people uh, like me have to these things, there's a proliferation of writing now um, from across the globe of legal experts and jurisprudence trying to forecast or predict how entire uh, legislative bodies or indeed judges will act. So on your screen here, uh, there's a, a Supreme Court forecasting project in the United States that was undertaken. And it seems to have some sort of diagnostic validity at trying to guess what the Supreme Court will do. Similarly, we have had uh, this team out of the US uh, look at the uh, justice blocks and how predictable individual judges might be. 
uh, and to quote the slide, our results show that it is possible to use methods developed for the analysis of complex social networks to quantitatively investigate historical questions related to political decision making. So here we have another claim that, uh, again, being very good at uh, this body of historical cases, that is everything that has come before, has some sort of diagnostic uh, value in doing the right thing or making the right decision today. So my ears pricked up a little bit further when I heard that. This is a team also out of the US. Uh, the Supreme Court in the US has obviously been a sort of a hotbed of doing this largely because these cases uh, are available freely online. So it's really easy to build models when you have data like this. this uh, and I'll skip through, but we have a team here uh, using machine learning to predict decisions in the ECHR and Brazilian court decision, but they're all unified by this sort of general. Uh, so uh, the title of my presentation is called uh, Systematic Legal uh, Theology. Um, and I say that kind of uh, with, with a wink, but it really is premised upon a, a sort of truth claim that is coming from the sort of informational theory of communication. That is with more information and more data, if we have better tools to access and read previous cases, to draw inference from those cases, to really understand the words of those cases, then we will eventually reach some sort of point whereby all of the facets that you know, a human judge uh, makes use of, whether it's their reasoning, their wisdom, their intuition, their tacit innate knowledge, all become something that a machine can do. And my interest in this really crystallized when a colleague of mine at the University of Toronto said this. Specifically, he wrote, more data and methods of better inference will culminate in a legal singularity, establishing a more or less positively and normatively stable legal system sustained in a type of reflective equilibrium along the lines described by John Rawls in the theory of justice. Now, if you're all scratching your heads and wondering what that means, I have been doing the same thing uh, pretty much since the start of my PhD, because this question, this notion of uh, machine is not just transcending man, but uh, hitting some sort of uh, earlier point on this horizon whereby they transcend human judges um, is very interesting to me because it very much is that sort of minority report-esque world where the difference between you committing a crime and the microchip in your neck reporting you to the central authority and whatever punishment is, that seems to be practically from a technological perspective, what's required to make all of this work. So we've seen a proliferation of singularity-esque ideas in recent years. This on your screen, you'll see the economic singularity by Callum Chase, the social singularity. And indeed, uh, some of you might be familiar with one of the most popular examples, you've all know Harari's Homo Deus, which is a, a very sort of uh, transhumanist manifesto for, um, uh, the argument that uh, now the that argument that now that God is dead, the meaning of life is found in data, and the ever greater accumulation of data is the only sort of lens through which uh, human beings can find meaning. So, uh, if this sounds theological or at least semi-spiritual, it's because I think it very much is. Uh, this notion that data has become some sort of uh, ontologically superior uh, material or lens on reality um, proceeds. Uh, tech writ large now, regardless of what domain it is, whether it's medicine or in law. Um, the underlying assumption here is with more of X, there will be uh, more intelligence. And that may well be true. Um, this seems to be at least partially true on the basis of uh, predictions that have been made by people like Gordon Moore, the, uh, one of the co-founders of Intel, uh, who as far back as the 1960s, you know, uh, realized that microchips were doubling exponentially um, in terms of their processing power, what they could do, but they were also smaller and the amount of integrated transistors that could fit on a chip was roughly doubling every year. So we observed this sort of evolutionary, or at least a reliably um, evolutionary trend in the development of microchips uh, that seemed to indicate uh, what the uh, first speaker was talking about, a sort of inevitable upward acceleration of computational power. So if you map it out, uh, as he did, this is kind of what computers look like when uh, you try to map out the number of transistors over the time. Here you see 1971 to 2016. What we have is this, more or less a sort of exponential increase in how uh, powerful chips are. But the singularity doesn't uh, just presume that this will continue on in a nice sort of upward line. Uh, rather, it's a all bets are off kind of situation where uh, a snap of the fingers like Thanos in uh, the uh, Avengers films and everything that happens afterwards uh, is fundamentally different. 
Uh, so if this again sounds strange to you, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that a Hungarian American is largely responsible uh, for this idea. On your screen, you see uh, Jean von Neumann, uh, indeed one of the uh, greatest contributors to the theory of computation, the development of the atomic bomb, uh, amongst other things. But his prediction in 58 was that the ever accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life will give the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them cannot continue. Very, very sort of heavy and weighty to hear this, but then you remember that this is also the man that was largely responsible for the fundamental science of the atomic bomb. So he was someone who was deeply familiar with what the consequences and ethical ramifications were. But this brings me back to law. And uh, I, I think it's very fitting, and I hope there's time to discuss with the, uh, the, the first uh, panelist about the, the idea that uh, all of this is inevitable, this idea of a sort of inevitability to the progress of technology, and all this is going to happen anyway, so we shouldn't use today's standards to apply them to, to something. That is a, a tempting way to think about the, the world, but it doesn't really help us in the here and now, certainly from a legal perspective, help us resolve disputes, because law is primarily about resolving problems in the here and now. So if you want to uh, imbue law with these uh, computational tools, with artificial intelligence, with all these wonderful things, uh, one of the things that sort of lingers in my mind that underpins a lot of my research going forward is, well, what is the role of a legal system? What anthropological function does the legal system play? And more importantly, if we identify that role, does computation, uh, is it equally replaceable? Can we replace human judges with algorithmic judges and assume that the system as composed will still function um, towards whatever end or purpose it was designed for? Um, and this, where I have in mind here is the work of people like Alan Supio, um, Governance by Numbers, who was wrote expertly uh, about this, but um, we don't really know, uh, to, be, to be honest, but what I have identified in my work and what I am particularly interested in, uh, especially because I've studied religion, I've studied the development of science, is that all of this becomes possible, um, this idea that uh, computational intelligence and biological intelligence are in some sense equal despite whatever they spring forth from. Um, I think it underpins a lot of thinking and rhetoric within the legal tech industry, but practically it requires you to start dumbing yourself down to make computers look good. I'll give you some examples here. As far back as the 16th century, we had people like Gottfried Leibniz, who some of you might be familiar with if there is indeed lawyers in the room, uh, yearning to sort of build a mathematical theory of reality, specifically of law, that allowed lawyers to make uh, expert decisions and precise judgments, just like mathematicians would, by formalizing legal reasoning. If you have a duty of care and there is a breach, then X. And a lot of law uh, shakes out like this, and that there is a formal and algorithmic structure to legal reasoning. That's what allows it to be at least predictable over time. But Leibniz's ambitions were greater. He thought that everything in the world, that is reality itself was indeed mathematical, and that mathematics in his case, uh, calculus was some sort of ineffable language that expressed this sort of divine structure of reality. And of course, if uh, the imposition of law is one of the sort of greatest ends that these human societies should strive towards, mathematizing law and making law as predictable as the pure sciences was in his view, a very noble goal. Quote, the only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as those of the mathematicians. So we can find our error at a glance and when persons are in dispute, we can simply say calculimus and see who's right. So here we have this basic idea that lawyers should be able to come together, get out their abacus or their calculators, sit down and come out to a sort of amicable solution because legal disputes will have this self-evidently correct output. Um, it's a very nice way to think about law, but. Uh, you know, if, if there are lawyers and judges in the room, we don't often think that there is a right or wrong a binary answer to questions. There are rather many routes and potential pathways to outcomes. Um, those might be beneficial or good or bad. But we don't tend to think ideally uh, in binary. We are starting to see the same thinking be endorsed by the sciences. On your screen here, you have a quote from Max Tegmark, a physicist at MIT who is straight up endorsing this notion of a robot dudges, the idea that we could have a algorithm that tirelessly enforces the same standards without succumbing to human error, such as bias, fatigue, or lack of latest knowledge. Again, human frailty is one of the things here that humans are biased, we're messy, we're prejudiced, and indeed, 
Uh, these things are probably insurmountable. Ergo, we should abdicate the uh, responsibility for making decisions because machines will do them better than us. 2019, this is Eugene Volokh at UCLA, a very well-known American legal scholar, uh, endorsing the idea of a legal Turing test. Basically an idea that if we develop a decision-making algorithm that outputs a judgment or uh, a case report that is rhetorically persuasive in the way that legal judgments are rhetorically persuasive only to lawyers, um, we should accept those judgments. Again, I see this as a sort of lowering of the standard uh, to make computers look smart, which is something we see across society, whether it's having teachers teach to algorithms, uh, to make students, you know, teach students to algorithms. Um, this is the idea that uh, we should lower our standards of uh, jurisprudential evidence to what a machine outputs. And if it looks fine, then it's good enough. And I find that very strange, um, at least, you know, sort of explaining to my first year students. But I think if you want the simplest through line to understand the tension of what might be lost in law, um, a lot of this is very abstract as you're talking about mathematical realities and all these sort of uh, you know, esoteric topics that are very difficult for people to get their heads around. Well, it's been very, very fortunate, and I think this is the right time, uh, certainly with a certain football tournament going on, to have a very, very practical example of how we expect not the computational theorists and computer scientists or the lawyers that are enthusiastic about AI to respond to this idea of robot judges. But what happens when people do? Because football provides us with an excellent example of what happens when we try to get every question right. If you, I'm, I'm sure, I don't follow the Hungarian league as close as I'd like, although I am very interested in Gulashia having coming to Manchester United at some point in the near future. But you might know about this phenomenon called video assistant referee which has been uh, something FIFA has been doing in football matches, indeed at the tournament right now, to basically use computers, cameras, and all manner of uh, tools to help on-field referees make a decision. If you watch football, you know precisely what I'm talking about. And indeed, this idea that we could use technology works in sports, uh, hockey and baseball. So why wouldn't it work in football? Well, if you watch football, there is indeed something very unique about it. It's a game premised upon spontaneity, uh, moments of sort of joy and catharsis. So there was an inherent tension between using these computational tools to make decisions or try to make the right decision all the time uh, when you're trying to translate it to football. So judging by the international reaction to VAR, despite it being still the standard worldwide, people don't seem to really enjoy it. Football fans, certainly here in England, uh, chant uh, all manner of things, which I would not dare say uh, out loud right now. But I'm sure if you are a fan yourself, you will know that there has been a massive backlash across Europe and indeed the world. world um, you know, you know that it's not football anymore. And I think that when people object to VAR, what they are touching upon is a very... Uh, unique notion that lawyers are familiar with. That is that the letter and spirit of the law. There is something between what is written in the text and what is reasoned in that text or of that text uh, that is very different in just applying the same sort of historical standard procedurally or mechanistically doesn't necessarily capture exactly what referees uh, are able to capture by making decisions on the pitch. Um, you might not get it right all the time, but when you start trying to perfect things or use history as a guide uh, to make decisions in the present, algorithms teach us very clearly, certainly in the United States context, um, if you're going to do policing and your historical data shows a lot of young black males being arrested, uh, you're probably going to orient your police force around doing that because history has been a guide for you to do that in the present. So we have seen algorithms having this sort of disproportionate and discriminatory effect on people. Uh, I'll only cite a couple books here that I think make the argument much better than me in terms of how this works. Um, but we have seen real legal consequences that are growing and mounting. I can only uh, sort of you know, blaze through these now. In Australia, we had a crisis um, when the government used a sort of automated debt reconciliation scheme, uh, which automated the sending of letters out to wealth recipients, which recited uh, a number of suicides, all manner of sort of crises. And I believe the UN censured the Australians uh, for their use of sort of uh, in, in instituting a sort of digital welfare dystopia, I believe the special rapporteur said. So we have real world bad examples of what happens when you uncritically apply these things in sensitive legal contexts, but it's difficult to balance against what we see in Estonia, where robot judges are currently just resolving cases under a thousand euros. 
To say nothing of the vastly more advanced uh, things that are going on in China, uh, there is, of course, pushback in Europe, and indeed, uh, because this is a, a, a class on uh, a, a seminar on the future of Europe, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't say that there is good evidence from France about how uh, ministries of justice might be interested in handling this. Uh, the French more or less kicked data scientists out of the court uh, to model judicial reasoning with a view towards trying to predict what individual judges do. Um, their argumentation was kind of like uh, counting cards in a casino. Not exactly illegal, but it will get you kicked out of the casino if you do it. So I think that's a, a good model because, um, well, I, it, 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 it's a, you might not like what you find when you allow people to get as granular with uh, legal processes um, uh, that they were doing. So I'll conclude with this. Uh, I should say, uh, I think it should be a clear to a number of people as to what happens when you decide to institute this at scale. Xinjiang promise, uh, provides us with ample evidence of what happens in the scale of control that you can uh, uh, wield over people uh, when you sort of orient these systems towards policing and surveillance and monitoring. Of course, this is but one example of which there could be many, um, but I think it, it, it behooves governments, certainly in Europe, uh, to be mindful of their own history of what happens when uh, you come to uh, very stark uh, conclusions that are backed by evidence um, and then try to build elaborate systems to justify uh, the subjugation of peoples. That's a dark road that I, I hope Europe never goes down, but uh, some uh, progress is being made. So I'll conclude with this. It's a provocation for discussion, uh, and it sort of underpins everything I say. One of the most important questions I think that, uh, that remains unresolved is what are the red lines for AI? And by that, I mean, what are the contexts for simply we cannot allow AI decision making to take place regardless of how the uh, uh, tantalizing uh, the gains might be in efficiency and productivity because uh, we cannot have a legal system uh, that I believe is legitimate unless we can answer that question. What function are we actually serving here? Um, and if, if, in my opinion, I think it's not the people. Um, I don't think it's legitimate. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. And I appreciate uh, everyone's time and attention. Thank you very much.